بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين بالقاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الماسومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة أيحسب الإنسان أن لن نجمع عظاما بلا قادرين على أن نسوي بنانا بل يريد الإنسان ليفجر أماما صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As you know this majlis is being in performed for the Salih Sawab of Marhum Rais Hassan Zaidi, you recited Surah Fatiha for his uh, deceased soul. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate the status of the Marhum, give him a place in the Jawar of Masumin alayhi wasalatu wasalam. And although it's the first birthday, but we still ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give patience and solace to the bereaved family for the loss that they have suffered. That indeed, uh, losing a loved one it's uh, difficult to get over because of the attachment that we have with these, um, you know, whether it be a father figure or a mother figure or anyone. But nonetheless, this is the way this world goes as the time goes by. It's the best cure for any heart as the time progresses and the time passes by. And we see that this is the way the world runs, that some people come in, some people leave this world. So the ayat of Qur'an are very straightforward in this regard. I don't have a great deal of time to emphasize on this uh, specific topic, so I'll stick to my discussion that I recited the first five verses from Surah Qiyamat. And these ayat are, Urdu mein kahenge, badi qiyamat ki ayatay hain. That if you pay attention towards as to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts out by taking an oath, He said, لا أقسمو بيوم القيامة That I do not need to swear by the day of Qayyamat. So it's so obvious that I really don't even have to swear by it. And that's why the word La over here is not giving you the negative meaning. Rather, it means that I swear by the day of Qayyamat. Wala uqsimu bin nafs lawama. And I do not need to swear by this self critical soul while I am swearing and taking an oath by the self critical um, you know, soul. And then the ayat progresses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing our attention towards some of the facts that some people might be in doubt whether it will take place or not. But before I get to that, what is the discussion of Qayyamat and nafs al Obviously there are different types of nufus that you've heard a great deal uh, in the past. But this nafs al which is the self-critical soul, which is doing the malamat, which is, you know, criticizing you yourself, that as to why do you do this, why do you do that? What's the relationship between the two? It could be mentioned that on the day of judgment, there will be, you know, criticism over there. It will be a judicial system over there. Similarly, a judicial system is present in every single person's heart, in every single person's soul in the form of this nafs al that you're able to criticize yourself, hold yourself accountable over here in this life before you move forward. So that is a system which is present over here before we even reach the barga of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we will be held accountable. If you look at the next three verses, it says, أَيَحْسَبُ insan أَنْ لَنْ نَجْمَعَ Does this insan think that we will not be able to bring his bones back to life because they have decapitated, they have gone and they have no longer existing? No. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to create from without any substance, then there's nothing uh, stopping him from creating you from the substance which 
which already exists. Yes, it might be scattered around for you, but it's not difficult at all for us. We just say kun and it becomes. So he says, Do you think we will not be able to do so? No, not that we won't be able to do so. When you ask someone so a question, which is a difficult thing to do, a lot of ways you could answer this question. Sometimes you could just answer by saying, yes, we're able to do it. Sometimes a person goes beyond that and answers in a way that you look at it, if he's able to do this, then definitely he will be able to do that as well. And that's what the ravish and the method that Allah adopts over here. Instead of answering that, will we be able to collect your bones back or not? He goes a step forward by saying, Bala, qadirina ala an nusawwiya banana. Not only the bones, we are capable of putting your fingertips back together. The way the fingertips and the fingerprints are there right now, we will be able to bring them back together again. So don't worry about the adam and the bones that is already taken care of and then he said but yuridu linsano li yafjura amama but insan wants desire of living viciously and this will continue for him and he will not be able to understand it until the trumpet is blown until he sees it himself until ya'tiya kal yaqeen so we look at it that indeed these verses of quran from surah qiyamah are bringing our conscious back to understanding as to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of doing and what is it that we should be expecting on the day of judgment. Here, after having mentioned this, indeed it is in the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recreate everything and this, these ayat are actually answered to those who say that Qiyamah will not be in the physical form. No, Qiyamah will be ma'ad jismani You and I will be raised with the same bodies that we have right now. Yes, when the life leave, when the soul leaves this body, when the death takes place, the body is buried, the soul moves on to barzakh. But at the day, on the day of judgment, they will be united back together. According to these verses, when Allah is saying, we'll bring the bones back together, we'll bring your fingertips back together. What does that mean? That means it will be embodiment, the ma'ad, a jismani, your same bodies will be there, you'll be able to recognize these people or your bodies as well. So this is where this is the answer to those who might have any sort of doubt that the ma'ad is just superficial or ma'ad is something which is only souls will be there and the bodies will not be there and that is again an answer to those who think the miraj of our Prophet was in a way that he went and ascended and his soul ascended, not his body. No, his body ascended. It was jismani and Prophet came back with the same body. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. But philosophy of life, if I can just put it in a nutshell for you very quickly, it should be, there are two versions of it. There's a version which a mu'min believes in and there's a version which a ghayr mu'min believes in. You and I should be on the category where a mu'min, the one who has faith, believes in the life and the philosophy of the life. Even if we did not have this book, Holy Qur'an, even if we did not have the commands of ma'asumeen and their instructions, is still through this aql that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, you would be able to say that there is a hereafter. A question to those who say, well, you know, you will live this life and you will be buried and you'll die and there's nothing tomorrow. There's an answer to them. Even if you do not believe in any of these sacred texts, you'll be able to explain to them through this aql as well. And I'll try and do that in the next couple of minutes that I have. That if you look at a person before they're born and everybody now goes through this research has become so available and the advancement of medical science that they walk you through the step by step process of this embryo, this fetus and then this, this baby and you know going through the growing process that after four months all of the body parts are complete, right? The eyes are there. The ears are there, the heart is pounding, all of the other body parts now have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, this child who's in the womb of the mother, possesses two set of eyes, possesses set of ears, possesses a nose, possesses a tongue, possesses a heart, internal organs, as well as the external organs. The question is, does this child in the womb of the mother for the next five months, after all of these things have been completely created, does he really need these eyes? Does he really need these ears? Does he really need this nose? Does he really need this heart? Does he really need these lungs? Does he really need these kidneys? Does he really need all of these hands that God has, all the hands and the feet that God has created, all the fingers that God has created? 
he doesn't need it to that extent in the womb of the mother. He doesn't need to see anything over there. He doesn't need to listen to anything. Although we believe that every time the mother listens to something or says something, it will be affecting the body. So it is highly recommended during pregnancies that mothers should only listen to things which are permissible for them to listen. Listen to Quran as much as possible. Stay away from vain talk. Stay away from gossip and so on and so forth. Because all of these things will be affecting the body, but the baby in the, in the, in the womb of the mother. Therefore, does he really need these arms, these hands, these feet, all of these things? No, not to that extent. He can survive without all of these things. But this is where you understand that if he doesn't need them over there, there's a world that he will be sent to where he will need all of these things. He will need these feet eventually to walk upon. In the womb of the mother, he doesn't need to go anywhere. He will need these hands in this world where he can grab onto things eventually. He will need this respiratory system. He will need this heart. He will need all of these organs for him to breathe properly, for him to smell something, for him to hear and listen, for him to be able to speak. All of these things need to be functional, functioning properly, but he does not, might not need him in the womb of the mother. So here it is telling you that while we have created every single thing, while the baby Baby is in the womb of the mother, he does not need it over there, but this is actually a prediction that there is a life ahead of this womb where he will need all of these things. Now what I'm alluding to is that when we live in this world, do we have what we demand? Do we get to all of those desires that we have? Is there a way that we can all remain young forever? Is there a way that we can ward off all of the illnesses? Is there a way that poverty does not come towards us? Is there a way that the loved ones always remain with us? No. Everybody goes through ups and downs in their life. Poverty strikes them. It does not sometimes. Everybody sees health diminishing, health getting progress and whatnot. Everybody sees all of these different stages of the life. Nothing is considered to be perfect as far as what our lives are. So therefore, this is also giving you a point and understanding that you might not be able to live fully in this world, but because God has created all of these things for you, that there is another place where you will be able to utilize all of these things properly. Where all of your desires will be completely fulfilled, where life will always be life and there will not be any death for you, where there will not be any illness for you, you will never get sick over there, there will never be any poverty for, for you, you will always remain affluent and so on and so forth. So this is an understanding for us that when you are unable to live up to the expectation in this world, then there must be a hereafter where all of these things that God has created for us will come true. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So this is a way that you can explain to those who do not believe in any sacred script as to understand what is to explain understand what is to expect in the hereafter that's why a prophet said to abu dhar he said ightanim khamsan qabla khamsan oh abu dhar make sure that you utilize five things before other five things take over them what are these five things he said shababaka qabla haramik your youth before you get old Lest is it that people, when they get older and older, they're hoping, I don't know, we're not at that age yet, but they might be hoping that we turn back to the youth years. Or they try to look youthful by different ways and means. And you know what I'm talking about. So people are always constantly trying to look as youthful as possible. Second we see, he says, وَالصَّحَتَكَ قَبْلَ سُقْمِكَ Take care of your health before illness comes upon you. This is, I remember, one of the sayings of our Imam, our fourth Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu wa salam. He said, Oh Lord, I don't know when, should, when to be thankful more for you. When should I be more thankful to you? When I'm sick or when I'm healthy? He said, I come to this conclusion that I should be more thankful to you when I'm sick. Because only then I can understand the worth and the value of health. 
I don't understand it when I'm healthy. So I, for I should be thankful when you give me illness. So illness is something which I look forward to and I thank you more because then and only I can understand the value and the worth of the life that you have given and the health that you have given to me. He said, well, make sure, make sure that you utilize your sufficiency before you become dependent on someone else. Well, make sure that you utilize the time that God has given to you before you get occupied with all these other things. And make sure that you use this life before mouth and death takes upon you. So Prophet mentioned these five things. Although two things are similar in this. One this shabab and one this hayat. Why is it that twice does he talk about shabab before you get old and hayat before you leave this world? In other words, he's basically comparing these two things. That hayat is like your shabab years and your uh, you know later years are basically like this death. So therefore, take sh- make sure that you take care of these things properly before they are out of your hands. Sallallahu Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Here we understand that insan is indeed created ba'if. Inna l-insana khuliqa ba'ifa. That insan is created ba'if. No matter what power you attain in this world, still you will remain da'if in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's no farar from this mouth, this death will definitely come upon you. And usually when there are Isa al this is a good time for us to ponder over this life that God has given to us so that we can prepare better for the hereafter. There was a, I don't know if it's a true or not story, but it basically explains to us the philosophy of life and death. When you look at the philosophy of hijrat, you will be able to understand the philosophy of life and death. What do you do when you do hijrat? A lot of us over here are muhajireen. We all migrated from one place to another. When we were migrating, if we had this opportunity that we can go back, or we were able to have any control over things that we were leaving behind, we would have left things behind the same way. But we did not have that opportunity when you were migrating. What did you do? You brought everything that mattered to you with you. Everything that you would be in need with you along with you. You did not leave anything behind that was you know, necessary for you. You only left those things behind or back home that were unnecessary that you could let go of. And you brought all of those things with you in this life over here that are necessity for you, that are needed by you. Therefore, you look at the life and death in the same way. There was a person who was uh, had the best of the both worlds he was very you know fortunate to have a very good business and he was able to live a very uh, wealthy life but at the same time he was able to live a very devoted and you know life which is filled with worship and whatnot when he left this world his family was asked what did he leave he said, well, he left all of this property. He said, what else did he leave? He said, he left all of these children. He said, what else did he leave? He said, he leave, left this property back home. He left these things over here. He left this, he left this, he left this. He said, what else? He said, that's it. What else do you want to hear? He said, what about his prayers? What about his good deeds? What about his charities? What about his fast? What about his art? He said, you talked about things that he left. You did not ask about things that he took with him. These are the things that he took with him. Those were the things that he left behind. What did he take with him? All of his salat he took with him. All of the charity work that he performed he took with him. All of the hajj that he had performed. All of the other good deeds and the obligations that God had bestowed upon him. He performed and he took all of those things with him. You want to know what he left behind? He left behind the property. He left behind the wealth. He left behind all of these things. So this is the concept of muhajirat. This is the philosophy of Mahajirat, you and I should look over it and take heed from it as well that that which we need for tomorrow, the best of Zadul Akhira, at Taqwa, have we accomplished that or not? Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Alaihi Muhammad. But there is a reason that we are all afraid of death. One of the reasons is because we do not understand the uh, actual reality of death. According to Amir al-Mu'mineen, it's like changing a cloth which is used and no longer needed and putting on a beautiful piece of clothing. That's what death is for him. That you put on, you take off this clothing that you don't need anymore, which has been used up already, and you're putting on a clothing which will be beneficial, which, will, which makes your looks good. Another reason is because we fail to understand that this world is compared with a prison. If a person who lived and spent, 
you know, many years of a life in his prison, when he's being freed from the prison, you think this person will be crying? You think this person will be upset that why am I leaving this prison? No, he's looking forward to exit from this prison. So we don't have the proper understanding as to why we do not look at this death in a positive way. But yes, when it comes to a loved one, when you lose a loved one, indeed it is very difficult. But these are the words that we need to tell each other. That's why when Abu Dhar was asked as to why it is difficult for us to leave this world, he said, because أَنَّكُمْ أَمَّرْتُمُ dunya, Because you have inhabited this world وَخَرَّبْتُمُ akhirah, And you have destroyed the hereafter. Who would want to leave established place and go towards a place which has been destroyed? So therefore, do something in order for you to establish something over there before that happens. And so we look at that every time someone loses life, a loved one, we say, may Allah give you sabr. May Allah give you patience to go through this difficult time. And indeed, it's patience which is required because at that very delicate moment, this is where shaitan has the opportunity to go ahead and, you know, temper with our faith. To go ahead and give these thoughts and do waswas that people might not be able to think is straightforward. And therefore, whenever a difficult time comes upon us, there's one thing that is in possession that no one has, that when we remember that, we forget all of our sorrow and all of our grief. And that is Karbala. That if a loved one is lost, yes, indeed, we are crying and we are in this state of grief. But as soon as we think about Karbala, we forget all of our gham. We forget all of our grief because we know that there's no grief and there's no gham that should be compared with the grief and the sorrow of Karbala and the inhabitants of Karbala. And this is where I just want to take a few moments of your time. Look at how Imam Wasalam, when he was entering into the battlefield. Just that scene, if you could look at it, that Imam has brought all of his family members with him. He bids farewell to all of the ladies. Imam Hussain that is. It's not easy. You heard in the Marsiya that how it must have been difficult for Imam that he's picking up the bodies from the one after another, one after another, one ashab after another ashab, one companion after another companion. And once all the companions had given their sacrifices, it was the family members. It is also mentioned when his son Ali Akbar asked Imam that he could go to Maqtal, Imam did not hesitate for one second and he said, Taqaddam waladi. Anyone else who came to Imam and asked him for permission, Imam stopped, Imam thought for a second, and Imam gave them a couple of opportunities to ask before he gave permission. But through Akbar, he did not hesitate one moment, lest someone might say, Imam had love for his own son. Which is only natural. Imam Wasallam is doing this wida with his family. He's leaving for Maqtal. He gets on to his uh, Zuljana and he wants to leave. But he sees that his horse is refusing to move. Imam asks this horse that you've been with me all these years. You've been loyal to me all this time. This is one last ride that I'm asking for. And I will not bother you again. Please move. But when the horse does not move, Imam looks down towards the feet. And he sees this his young daughter Sakina. No. Attached to the feet of the horse, Imam comes down, picks up Sakina, puts her onto his chest and says, Oh my daughter, we had already bid farewell to you, why have you come back? She said, Oh my dad, I wanted to sleep one last time on your chest the way I used to. Imam, these, these are the words some of the Mufas and some of the Murrakhin have mentioned. Imam said this to the young daughter, the four-year-old Sakina, that no longer will you be sleeping on on the chest of your Baba. In fact, we have switched places. From now on, your brother Ali Azhar will sleep on the chest of Hussein, and you will have to get acquainted to sleeping on the chest of your mother. Allah Please recite a Surah Fatiha for Marhum Sayyid Rais Hassan Zadi, Ibn Tajamul Hussain Zadi. Tajamul Hassan Zadi.